Well, hi there. Uh, I started reading The Portable Atheist, uh, an anthology compiled and collected by Christopher Hitchens. And I read the first few sections of it today, and I'm quite enjoying it. It's um, arranged in approximately chronological order. So we start off uh, with Lucretius, who lived, I think, first century BC. But Christopher Hitchens begins the festivities with his own introduction, which is his um, standard diatribe against religion. One portion of it I found pretty amusing is this. Christopher says, I have included what many serious novelists and poets have had to say on this most frighted of all subjects, that is, religion. And who, really, will turn away from George Eliot and James Joyce and Joseph Conrad in order to re-scrutinize the bare and narrow and constipated and fearful world of Augustine, Aquinas, Luther, Calvin, and Osama bin Laden? <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny, really, for two reasons. I've tried reading James Joyce. <laughs> Give me the old constipated holy books any day. <laughs> Sorry. And... Uh, the other reason I found that funny is, well, I am reading the uh, <laughs> constipated religious writers, so uh, what does that say about me, right? <laughs> anyway, the um, book starts off with a selection, a long selection, actually, from Lucretius on his um, On the Nature of Things, which goes into atomic theory of all things. Now, I had known about this, that the Greeks had um, postulated the atomic theory, that is, that all substances are made of, of, of uh, infinitesimally, infinitesimally small um, atoms, for lack of a better term, or discrete matter, that matter can be chopped only so finely before it can be chopped no further. And uh, I know I, Lucretius and uh, who Epicurus maybe was another one of these uh, characters who postulated these things. But I'd never actually read any of this work. It's really pretty interesting. Uh, listen to this. Clearly, to speak as I tell of the primary atoms of matter out of which nature forms things, tis things she increases and fosters. Then back to atoms again, she resolves them and makes them to vanish. Things, for argument's sake, my want is to speak of as matter. Also, the seeds of those things, to name the small parts which beget them. Further, those infinitesimal parts, an alternative figure, primary atoms to call, whereof matter was all first created. That's really interesting. You know... In, in Christian apologetic circles, we're giving st standard arguments to, um, we're giving standard arguments to why the Bible is the divinely inspired word of God, as they call it. And one of the reasons is it predicts scientific discoveries and advancements long before they were actually discovered by secular science. For instance, uh, I don't have the um, the Bible passages off uh, with me offhand, but uh, there's a passage in Isaiah, something about the um, uh, the earth being a a sphere. Well, actually, the Bible says it's a circle, but they'll say it's a sphere, or the uh, earth hangs upon nothing, or I think somewhere in Ecclesiastes, it's claimed that it. Uh, foresees the hydroponic cycle of the earth or something like that where the rains fall on the mountains goes to the sea evaporates and goes and then rains down again you know who could have foreseen that except uh, therefore god wrote it well that's all well and good but consider this Lucretius wrote about atomic theory in the first century bc as i just uh, read right here um, and it goes on and on. There's quite a bit more here to it, but it's pretty clear. It's pretty non-ambiguous. Uh, matter is discrete. 
and that's, this was something that was not actually discovered until, what, the early 20th century. So, using the arguments from the Christian apologists, can we say then that Lucretius is a divinely inspired author? After all, he foresaw scientific advancements that was not discovered until modern days, just like the guys in the Bible, maybe. So, I don't know, just something to think about. And something else I saw, I saw that was kind of interesting, a quick snippet here from Lucretius. Never did will of gods bring anything forth out of nothing. For in good sooth it is thus that fear restraineth all mortals, since both in earth and sky they see that many things happen, whereof they cannot by any known law determine the causes. So their occurrence they ascribe to supernatural power. That's interesting. You know, in the first century BC, over 2,000 years ago, the God of the Gaps has already existed. We don't know something, we ascribe it to some deity. That must be the cause of it. Um, it's an old argument. Very fascinating. Well, the next selection is from somebody I'd never heard of before, Omar Khayyam. I'm sorry, I, I know that's mispronounced, but I don't think he's around to uh, chastise me for mispronouncing it. But it looks like this is um, early or mid-11th century. And um, he looks, I, it doesn't say explicitly where he's from. Yeah, here it is, medieval Persia. And I'm not sure what language they spoke in medieval Persia, but I can guarantee they did not speak English. And it's always made me suspicious when poetry, especially poetry that has been translated from ancient languages into English, somehow rhymes and is in perfect meter in English. Um, I can never quite understand how that works. It just kind of makes me suspicious. Consider this from Omar Khayyam, a, uh, a, a speaker of some ancient Persian language in the mid-11th century, it says, Allah, perchance, the secret word might spell. If Allah be, he keeps his secret well. What he hath hidden, who shall hope to find? Shall God his secret to a maggot tell? Oh, that's perfect rhyming in English. Um, not sure how they are able to do that. That just makes me a bit suspicious that this has been paraphrased beyond all recognition. Well, those are just my initial thoughts on the portable atheist. Uh, this is going to be a long one. And so uh, tomorrow, on my wild seesaw reading, back to Christian mysticism. Later.